Hello and welcome to Faragdamu. The African Union summit this weekend, among other things, deliberated on the need to fight corruption. Integration was another defining topic. But what did we get out of this conversation? My guest today, Professor Adebayo Olukoshi, is a long-time observer of African issues. You're yeah, very warm welcome to the program. Thank you very much. We had the 30th uh, uh, African Union Heads of State Summit in Addis Ababa last week, which actually ended this uh, early this week on Monday, right? Yes. And the, the, the defining theme for this year's, for this summit was winning the fight against corruption, a sustainable path to Africa's transformation. It's a very serious thing, corruption in this continent, more so in the last 10 years. Do you agree? Well, I think nobody will dispute it, uh, that one of the biggest challenges we have uh, confronting our development on the continent, be it political, be it economic or social, is the problem of corruption. And uh, uh, the choice of the theme uh, was applauded uh, by many observers as perhaps indicating uh, an interest to revisit the subject because it's not the first time that it has been... Exactly. Uh, are, I mean, are, are people serious about it? Are the heads of state serious about it, do you think? You've been part of the, 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 the entire session of the, of the AUs. Yes, I, I, would, I would hope so, that uh, for the fact that uh, it was unanimously adopted as the signature theme. But it, it's interesting. The reason why I mention that is because uh, we had, what, the... AU Convention on Prevention and Combating Corruption was adopted in July of 2003. That was 14 years ago. And the last, the date of entry was into force was August of 2006. And 14 years after the adoption, we had the last signatory. It doesn't show that people are taking it seriously, are they? Well, uh, I, would, I would argue that um, uh, corruption... Like many other challenges, uh, it's, not, it's not a problem that is easily eradicated. It's a universal challenge which uh, confronts uh, every society. Um, as you close one door uh, to corrupt practices, it's likely that other doors will, ho will open. Uh, and uh, the um, challenge of governance and to those who are entrusted uh, with looking at our co the common interest is uh, to um, keep pace <laughs> with the evolution uh, of the problem and to make sure that it doesn't overwhelm the system. Yeah, it uh, does it? I mean, my question. Is, in some countries, without any question, it overwhelms. And it, the, the, fact, the fact that it took 14, I mean, 14 years yes. after the adoption yes. of the convention, we're still talking about corruption and no meaningful... Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I would add, I would argue that perhaps one of the reasons why uh, it, it, it hits us more um, prominently uh, in the present time is also that those 14 years, on the whole, have been years of tremendous change on our continent. In what sense? The economic it? growth, for example. Uh, uh, we entered into the new millennium uh, with a lot of uh, problems. Uh, of, of stagnation, of uh, uh, lackluster economic performance, uh, and so on. Uh, and then in the decade uh, following <laughs> the dawn of the new millennium, Africa actually recorded uh, its uh, highest growth uh, cycle uh, in a very long time, um, which brought about a lot of changes, both positive and negative. And I would say that one of the more negative aspects uh, of that um, uh, revival of growth uh, was also the expansion uh, of corruption uh, on a massive scale in many countries. Because money was flowing in into the money continent and will be flowing out too. Absolutely. Money was flowing in um, uh, in a context in which, for example, in a few cases, you would find that the capacity of public administration was also not matching up. What you're saying is that Africa was not ready to accommodate the amount of money that was flowing in. At the the governance system was not reset in too many countries in a way as to be able to effectively manage uh, the uh, growth cycle and the flow of resources, uh, both domestic and external. Um, and on top of it, with all of the um, weaknesses in public administration, uh, civil services that uh, largely demoralized in a majority of countries on the continent uh, of uh, public sector 
uh, salaries and wages uh, that are really, um, strictly speaking, uh, not able to sustain a decent livelihood uh, for civil servants. Uh, effectively, all kinds of avenues uh, were generated alongside with the growth cycle uh, to begin to fuel uh, uh, a cycle of corruption. And I think uh, the adoption of the convention uh, by the AU uh, was, in a sense, uh, a timely uh, step which was taken, followed up with the establishment of the anti-corruption uh, body of the AU, uh, headquartered, uh, I think, in Arusha. That's the anti-corruption board. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, which has been trying to find its footing. Um, uh, it has been trying to find its footing. It exists uh, and does meet. I've attended a few of the sessions right. of the anti-corruption board. Yeah. Uh, but it is also resource trapped, uh, and uh, to the extent to which it has been able to um, make a presence, it has depended really more on external sources of funding uh, from donors than from uh, funding from within the continent. Well, if it is a serious issue, why aren't African heads of state taking it seriously? So why is it cash strapped? Why don't they put money into that? That's what my, my, one of my questions is, yeah, well, because they simply don't take it seriously. You are right. I mean, one can, one can draw the conclusion also, if that was the case, that uh, perhaps they don't even take the AU seriously. Because let's, let's face it, uh, the, the, the board is uh, an institution under the auspices of the AU Commission. And you know that the issue of the financing of the AU has been uh, a live question for a very long time. Many of us Africans, uh, many of the staff of the AU, uh, many of the political leaders of the AU, a few of our own uh, presidents and prime ministers uh, have argued over a long period of time since independence that we must be prepared to put our money where our mouth is when it comes to issues of continental unity and integration. Um, it's only really uh, until maybe a few years ago, three, four years ago, that that issue began to be tackled seriously once again. And as you would uh, probably have observed during the summit uh, this, that just finished, uh, it became an issue again uh, of serious discussion uh, amongst the heads of state. Um, I think we are making some progress uh, towards uh, a reasonable degree of uh, self-financing uh, for the AU, at least the formula which has been adopted uh, to put a small uh, levy on, uh, on exports uh, is, is, is of the magnitude that is going to significantly uh, uh, improve the finances of the Commission and hopefully also of bodies like the Anti-Corruption Board. What steps should be taken, you think, uh, to address this issue of corruption? I think the, the most, well, first and most important thing is... Uh, you say the public sector, that's very interesting. Yes, absolutely. There has to be um, a political will at the level of leadership to tackle it. Uh, uh, corrupt practices would rear their heads uh, in almost all situations, uh, especially uh, situations where uh, opportunities are seen uh, to um, uh, take advantage of loopholes uh, that exist. And there is no country in the world that can close all loopholes uh, in its system. Now, I, I, I believe that if there is a will uh, amongst political leaders uh, recognize that this is an unacceptable problem that has to be tackled, we would begin to see the kinds of uh, uh, decisive measures that would need to be taken. Impunity will have to stop. I mean, nobody should be above punishment <laughs> when it comes to corruption. You don't uh, retire with tons of money in the bank. Absolutely. I mean, and, uh, you know, lifestyle audits, which some countries also undertake on our continent today. Uh, you are nominated to a position uh, of authority, and all of a sudden uh, you become the owner of a private jet, uh, and nobody can explain the visible source of your income. Uh, and nobody is asking you questions about it. Uh, and such, such measures, I think, can be taken. Um, some countries over time have tried to also um, intensify uh, civic education uh, in order to ensure that citizens themselves are able both to recognize the problem and to resist it and, and even to report it. 
uh, in more recent times, one of the trends which we have seen across the continent is the so-called whistleblower uh, policy, um, the institution of the public protector, uh, which in some countries also is a constitutionally guaranteed body. Uh, protected for independence and autonomy. But you need to have the democratic process in in full swing. Without that, we supply blowers would end up being dead. Absolutely, absolutely. And also the appropriate policy framework to protect whistleblowers because uh, uh, the risk of being a whistleblower in an environment of corruption is as is as horrible as being a whistleblower in a mafia <laughs> context uh, and, and, and the like. So, I mean, there is really no shortage of ideas and initiatives uh, that can be pursued in order to uh, combat uh, and contain corruption, uh, in some cases even to prevent it uh, from occurring. Uh, in, in, in our countries. But given the exercises that we see in this continent as we speak today, it's pretty much a frustrating experience, isn't it? It is. I, I would freely admit mm. that. Plenty, I, plenty of people are pessimistic. I would freely recognize that, that um, there are citizens uh, with some justification who believe that uh, that battle uh, is lost or the battle is not being fought with the resolute determination that is required, uh, that the political will is not there in a lot of cases, uh, for a lot of reasons. Because some of those who are also the drivers of corrupt practices are holders of political power, or the godfathers of those who hold political power. Um, so we often actually say in a lot of contexts that uh, to fight corruption is also to recognize that corruption will fight back. Exactly. Uh, and, 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 not and also to realize that that's one of the reasons nations fail. Absolutely. We have seen oh, yes. nations oh, fail yes. in front of our eyes oh, yes. in the African oh, continent. Yes. Oh, yes. I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's probably delicate to cite uh, any specific example of a country in a, Got you. in a context of this nature. But uh, you are absolutely correct that some of the wars which we have seen on our continent, uh, intra-country wars, domestic, uh, not interstate wars, but civil wars fought within countries, emanated without any question out of years of cumulative abuse of the public purse and of the public purpose to a point where citizens actually just gave up completely. And when you get to a point where corruption becomes really systemic uh, to a point where it actually undermines the basic logic uh, of the system, uh, inevitably, uh, it will be a matter of time before one form of collapse uh, or the other will be experienced. To another topic that was uh, one of the major highlights, you know, the integration of the African continent. We also have been talking about integration, call it economic or at the end of the day political, for decades in the African continent. Have we made any uh, meaningful stride forward uh, in the last um, AU summit, do you think? Well, we see the you know about the, the protocol, of the free movement of people, yes. which is a, which is quite a very very interesting one. But do we see the seeds sown here and there for that towards that end? You think, yeah. or is it just a talk in the plenary session of the African Union, which I, I, quite often is? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I there again, I think the <laughs> the politics of integration has been uh, intensifying over the last few years. Um, and, and my view uh, of what we witnessed at the last summit, uh, and even previous ones, is that on account of factors, um, both domestic and external, one can um, suggest that Africa is condemned to integration. Uh, and if we are going to be dragged screaming into integration, we are going to be dragged into it by factors some of which are really beyond us. And let me unpack it and explain what I mean. That would be very interesting because our individual country is ready. That's right. Um, in the first instance, I think uh, at the level of citizens, of ordinary Africans, uh, of uh, uh, cross-border communities, integration has been a fact of life for a very long time. So between Djibouti and Ethiopia, or between Somalia and Ethiopia, over historical periods that go to thousands of years, there have been 
a flow of people, regardless of what official policy may be. Some people refer this to this as the informal processes of integration or between Zimbabwe and South Africa, Bight Bridge as the, as the bridgehead uh, of the flow of people, um, between Nigeria and Benin Republic. Uh, you and I may carry a passport to cross that boundary. There are thousands of people who cross that boundary every day without a single passport, right? Uh, wake up in Benin Republic, cross over to Nigeria to transact your business, uh, run your little shop, and in the evening, walk back mm -hmm. to your home <laughs> on the other side of the border. But to make, to, 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 for that to be meaningful, yes. it has to be blessed at higher level. Absolutely. It does help. And that is where I think at the second level. So we have that process that has been going on for a very long period of time. Now, for all of this, as you rightly said, to really translate into a dynamic force for progress on our continent, um, policy has to both recognize it and even encourage it. And I think some of the experiences which our countries have had in recent times in the context first of the current phase of globalization uh, actually began to force a more serious reflection uh, on this. How does this continent survive? in a globalized world in which your ability, for example, to trade with yourself becomes an important factor of your ability to trade with the rest of the world, of your ability to encourage cross-border investment flows becomes an important element of your ability to even attract more investment into the continent, of your ability to create bigger markets. Uh, because strictly speaking, if you remove Ethiopia, remove Nigeria, remove uh, maybe four or five other countries, well, for majority of countries, their markets are really small. Domestic markets are small. And yet, we are adopting national plans that talk about structural transformation. So how are you going to adopt, achieve structural transformation and the kind of economic and social revolution which our national plans say we must achieve by 2020, 2022, 2025 on the basis of a market of 2 million, 3 million people. And I think that's what then gave um, some greater proportion to the idea, for example, of the continental free trade area, to the regional economic communities enjoying a new lease of life uh, across the continent. Uneven performance, uh, sometimes stimulated by political differences, uh, but without, with, without a disputing of the fact that we needed to integrate ourselves economically much more. Um, and uh, as you can see in a, in a number of cases, uh, even as political will and decision-making has lagged behind, we have seen even private sector operators coming in. Well, Dangote investing in Nigeria. Ethiopia Airways becoming almost like a continental airline. Um, uh, uh, banks uh, crossing boundaries. South African banks migrating uh, northwards. Uh, banks from Nigeria migrating across all of the West African sub-region, even into Eastern Africa. Things are happening it's, at that. That is happening, but with some of the critics of this uh, continental integration, what they say is, including uh, some of the issues that you just mentioned uh, right right now, is that you know there is no level playing field, and without that, it would be very difficult to forge some kind of integration. I, I, so we need to wait yeah. for some time before we actually move on along that I, direction. I Do not, you? I will not dispute that. I will not dispute that, and that's why I say that the political um, frame lags behind some of the objective processes that are already being witnessed across the continent. And I hope that with the discussions which we have had at the recent summit and uh, the acceptance speech uh, which uh, Mr. Kagame uh, delivered after his uh, election as the uh, chair of the, uh, of the, of the assembly uh, of heads of state uh, of, of the union for the next one year, in which he said, for example, the move, free movement of people on the continent is doable and is doable in 2018. Um, 
Disclosure if, if is that a pipe dream or something that's going to be materializing well, in 2018? It's very difficult <laughs> to do that. <laughs> it, it, that. I mean, you have no problem in West Africa. Now, in West Africa, yeah. we have the common West African passport, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Good. We are barely beginning here. And the free movement of people uh, in West Africa has been going on for a very long time. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and it has been to the benefit of the of the region as you exactly but here we have yet to get into the discussion well, well I, I don't want to be pessimistic about it because this is one of really my my most passionate uh, areas of, of concern uh, and of interest so if you take a country like rwanda which uh, also for uh, many years now has had a policy of visa on arrival for africans mm. mr uhuru kenyatta following his uh, re-election also made a pledge the president of Ghana made a pledge. Africans who come to Ghana can get their visa on arrival. You are seeing change taking place. Mauritius, if you are an African and you are not staying more than a certain period of But don't you think this is an overblown optimism when the president of Rwanda, Mr. Paul Kagame, said it's doable in 2018? Maybe it's also not a bad thing to dream. Now, remove your NGO hat. You are the executive director for the African region of International Idea. Remove that NGO hat that you are wearing. As an African, what do you think about 2063, Agenda 2063? Um, Certainly, you're not a pessimist, but you, you know, but you're not, you're not that optimist either, are you? Well, I, I'm not a wild and baseless optimist, but I think we, the, uh, I haven't also participated in some of the debates around uh, Agenda 2063. One of the points which I always emphasize uh, in celebration of the adoption of the agenda was that for the first time. Um, in the history, at least recent history of our continent, we were able to adopt and unite behind a common program uh, with very clear pillars and with milestones around what it is we should be achieving. Um, it's obviously uh, going to require a lot of effort to implement, including a coordination capacity, uh, not just at the national level, but at the continental level to drive this. It will require a lot of political will that it doesn't simply then become a slogan. Um, the, uh, does it the, run the risk of being won? It does run the risk. I mean, and we are not short of slogans on the continent, of, of blueprints that become essentially uh, papers that gather dust. But I think also in the construction of the Agenda 2063, there was a conscious effort to identify some of the previous commitments which we made as a continent and never implemented, and to try to drive these and, and build them into the aspirational document for the next 50 years. To the extent to which we are also committed to Agenda 2030, uh, like every people around the world, um, I hope that in the pursuit of Agenda 2030, we will also not neglect Agenda 2063, but in fact, take Agenda 2063 as an important building block around which we will try to fulfill our obligations on Agenda 2030. In cautious optimism, thank you very much, Mr. Holocaust. It was a pleasure having you on my show. Thank, thank you very, very much, much indeed. indeed. Thank you.